Hey, Tristan, I'm here for the show. Patrons, may I have your ears for just a moment, please? Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, we regret to inform you that due to a mechanical fault in the engine house, the transporter bridge has broken down and will therefore not be operating this evening. Oh. <laughs> I had you there, didn't I, huh? You should have seen your face! I bet you were like blooming egg. What a pain in the hole! We've travelled all this way! <laughs> with her long steel leg stuck deep into the muddy banks of the river us for 112 years. Nothing like the old tat they throw together these days. Oh no, she's been built to last. 1906 she was opened. You lot was barely a twinkle in your mother's eye. Or maybe even your mother's mother's eye. The transporter bridge, Newport. Pont Glenoch has no end for any Welsh speakers in the room. With her steel, lattice structure, she stands at a staggering 73.6 metres tall, and on a clear day she can be seen from as far as Bristol and Cardiff. But Newport's where she belongs. This is her place, her home, and is one of only ten transporter bridges remaining in the world, and only one of two still fully functioning. She is unique. Now, here we are all met in the Waterloo Hotel. This public house would welcome in crowds of shift workers who'd come tumbling through its doors from the docks, desperate for a sip of ale or maybe something a little stronger. They would travel across the transporter bridge and leave their working days behind them. Those days spoke of industry, innovation and, in turn, prosperity. Now let us gather and celebrate the heritage of the bridge and the memories of it. But let us also look ahead at what is yet to come and what the future might hold for this giant curiosity. You, all of you, yes, even you, tonight are unique because for the first time this lovely old lady of steel will play host to a theatrical, nautical tale. And so, as such, you will pay privy to it. Sixty-one years her junior, this story was formed, originally named The Whale. This chosen tale speaks of man's fractured relationship with land and sea, a tale of bitterness and revenge. It too speaks of hard-working men travelling to do their duty, to bring prosperity and need to those on land. This tale is that of the great white whale. This tale is Moby Dick! So gather yourselves, keep close, and let us make way to see the bridge in all her glory. Now, patrons, in around five minutes' time, you'll be heading across to the bridge. So if any of you do need to use the toilet facilities, please do so now. I, however, must bid you farewell from here, for I have a very important meeting to make in Nantucket, which, through the magic of artistic license, isn't that far away. Cheerio! See you soon! See you soon! Excuse me, patrons.
This bridge used to transport hard-working men from their everyday lives towards their toilsome livelihoods. Stands as a monument to this. Forged of iron and steel, born through sweat and blood, it mounts the waters whilst holding the land. It is a goliath of modern engineering and a testament to the sureness of humanity that might seek to overcome anything that nature places in our path. Tonight, it transports you here to pay privy to a different tale of men sent out to work. <coughs> men sent out to toil and slay, to hunt and kill, to overcome those things living in nature, them rare goliaths of the sea that represent more than profit and gain, but life death, and everything in between. This is where those worlds meet. So, who am I? I'm part of that lucky clutch of men that managed to wash back onto the land, or to be pulled out of the muddy banks of the Usk to be looked upon as safe. For when our bodies explain our physical state, nobody looks or sees the dark tar, iron or slag, whale gut and blood clot memories we So tonight, you can call me Ishmael, and I'll recant one such memory to you. For it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, and I feel a void in my chest that must be filled with new breath. So before I start growing grim about the mouth and involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses, I must escape the land and become tethered to the sea. Yeah! 
You lovely couple, we joined by a calf with an head. Wards off bad spirits. Said no, you ain't got any. What a May I meet this harpooner before we share a bed? Well, sir, I'm afraid he's gone out of peddling. Oh, what's he peddling? He's peddling heads, sir. Heads, sir. Heads, heads, heads. Hey! 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 Like a ring of onions. Listen, I could give you a bed. The bloke is a nice chap, right? Big enough a bed, big enough for two to be kicking around in, sir. So if I hear you yelping, I'll come in and save your soul from the mouth of a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> There you are, sir. <laughs> Take the key and um, hope the bugs don't bite. <laughs> Hello. My name's Ishmael. I've been put in the same bed as you. Not enough rooms. But I don't want to see any of those heads of yours, so if you could just keep them to yourself, then... What, that'd... these? Oh, I... Oh, it's wooden. <coughs> of course it is. Why, what did you think? That I was some sort of rare cannibal chopping off people's heads? That's the impression he gave me. Yeah, well, Mr. Coffin just likes to have too much fun. That's your harpoon. Aye. I'd have thought the ship would have provided you with one. Look, I'm not overjoyed at the prospect of sharing a bed either. But it's not like I haven't paid for this room just the same as- You're Christian. I am. And what do you think I am? What? Some islander. Oh, some tattooed native. No, nothing cannibal. No better than a vagrant or a drunk. Oh, oh, a godless man. Or at least a man who believes in a lesser god than you. No. Not at all. I made no assumptions about you or your god. To be honest, I don't give a damn what you believe. I'm here to sign to a whaling vessel, and this inn is where I'm going to stay until I do. So you plan to sign onto a ship? Aye. Tomorrow I'll go out and look for one. Then you should sign onto the p -Wad. Is that the one you're signed to? Aye. Is she ship soon, though? in the next few days, so it depends when you're ready to leave. As soon as possible, it's the only reason I'm here. Good. Then perhaps tomorrow I'll take you there, and you can see it for yourself. Right. <clears throat> Look, the way I was before is something I'd let stay me, and I should know better by now than to let it. But there's nothing in me that's accountable, okay? Sometimes looking the way I do and being here amongst Christians and other men. Well, it's why I spend so much more time at sea. It just seems to equal us all. From the sound of you, I'd say you'd always been here. <laughs> it's not where I grew up, but I've been here a while. 
see where I grew up was a far cry from all of this. See where I grew up, we'd hunt the animals on the land as much as these men do the sea. Only we'd live in tandem with earth and all these things. Oh, that place was all I knew until one day a ship landed on our shores and off it came men just like you. And it was like something new from the world. Some part of it I'd never known and wouldn't know <coughs> unless I followed it. So no sooner had they left and this ship was on the horizon, I felt some thump in my chest. Some pull, just some call from somewhere to just go. So I did. I took a canoe and I rowed fast about five miles until I caught up with the ship. And once I did, I grabbed hold of a keystone ring and I held on until the men, they looked overboard and they saw me there nearly drowning. And the captain, he hauled me up onto the deck and I thought he'd take one look at me and just throw me overboard, but he didn't, no. He placed a harpoon in my hand and he trained me in that way. And this is that harpoon. This is my harpoon. I remember Kwekwe's story. There was so much wisdom from one so young. So what is it you think you want? Oh, I don't know. Well, think. Uh, it's, um... <coughs> it's to be at sea. To feel myself on the ocean. To free myself. Free yourself from what? From the land. And everything on it. Shipmates, clinch the last chapter, first verse. Go. And God has prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah up. You see, the sin of Jonah was his willful disobedience of God. He found it a hard command. And God's command is hard, shipmates. Oh, yes, it is. Because when obeying God, we must disobey ourselves. But you see, Jonah not only marred his tenet with God by doing as he pleased, doing how to say ah, God things, but he further angered God by seeking to flee. Foolish Jonah thinks that a ship made by man will carry him to countries where his God does not reign. So, aboard a ship, he is put by himself. And in his tiny cabin, he is suffocated. The ceiling touching his nose's tip. The walls seemingly squeezing <coughs> in around him. The air so close that Jonah gasps for breath, but he breathes no easier. In that contracted hole, he has a glimpse, a glimmer of what his future holds inside that whale that shall keep him in the smallest of its power. Sweat dribbling down his brow, leg quivering with seasickness, a feeling in the pit of his belly, and then suddenly, with a crack of thunder smashing through the china plate sky, the ship begins to toss and turn. A storm comes onto that ship, and the bosun calls all hands to lighten the load. And over it all goes into the thick, spit-like ferocity of the waves. Anything weighing more than a man, or less than a man, but never a man is thrown. Until Jonah, 
who so wrought with the sickness and tension of his own creation, cries out, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who have made the sea and the dry land. I fear thee. And he has sent this storm to bind me so that I may set myself free. And with that, the sailors mark him. The God fugitive is known the pariah of the Lord, the bringer of this storm. And so, willingly or unwillingly, he must go into the spit. And so they take him. His flailing body, his bloodshot eyes, his crunched together teeth, and they cast him overboard for his own sake. For here is the man who has brought this dreadful tempest upon them. And as Jonah falls, he seems to feel it like no other thing. As the water breaks below him, and up and out from it comes a great big whale, who into the yawning jaws of he falls. A great beast sent to find him, and so it has. And so it shuts its jaws, and its teeth, they become like white bolts upon a person. Jonah, he tried to escape the fate laid out for him by God. Thought he could escape it at sea. But God is everywhere. And even in the belly of hell, God hears his cries, and God spake unto the great fish, and out from the shuddering cold blackness of the sea, the whale came swimming up, and many years after swallowing Jonah whole, he finally vomited him back up onto the land. That is when Jonah learned the truth of his fate. To do the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? Eh? To preach the truth in the face of falsehood. To live with the aim to please and not of all. And although Jonah's time inside the belly of the beast seemed like an eternity ten times, I leave eternity to thee. For what is a man that he should outlive the lifetime of his God? Ishmael! Ishmael! Is there an Ishmael here, please? I'm Ishmael! I'm Ishmael! Come here then, give me your papers. Come on! Stand over there. Ah, I can see from this you've never been on a stove, <coughs> which I suppose means you know not a thing about whaling. Eh? No, but it won't be a problem. I've served on many voyages in the merchant service, which has taught me how the to sell merchant many of them. The merchant service can be damned. That's no place to cut one's teeth. That's cot's play when thinking about getting on board a whaling ship, though I think you know it is. So tell me, Ishmael, what is it that makes you want to go whaling, hmm? I want to see what whaling is. I want to leave the land and see the watery part of the world. Oh, good. And are you the sort of man who could pinch a harpoon down a live whale's throat before jumping in after it? Yes. Yes. And what about your lungs, eh? They look a little soft to me. Can you last three long years at sea? Aye, sir, I think I can. Oh. You think no, you can? No, I know I can, sir. Yeah. I know I can. Cool. And you said you want to go whaling. Not to just experience what whaling is, but to see the world. Is that not what she said? Aye, sir. Aye. Go to the starboard bow, take a look over the edge, come back here and tell me what you see. I'm sorry? Go to the starboard bow, take a look over the edge and tell me what you see. The ocean. <laughs> I see the ocean. The ocean, you say. What about the ocean? Eh? That's what I see. I see the water and the horizon. <coughs> you don't think you can see what you want of the world from where you stand? No, sir. Good. Then a whaler you will be. Come and sign your name on the paper, please, Ishmael. Thank you. Thank you. I won't let you down. 
and your name is? Ah, uh, Starbuck. I'm the first mate aboard the Pequod, and the captain of it is Ahab. But listen, he's not been feeling himself of late. He keeps himself tight inside of his cabin and doesn't come out for much. But when he does, oh, by Christ, you'll listen. Why, Captain Ahab, he's been in colleges as well as amongst cannibals. He's fixed his gaze over stranger wonders than the waves and pitched his fiery lance into darker and stranger foes than whales. Oh, he's no Captain Peleg, boy. He ain't no Captain Bildad, neither. He's Captain Ahab, and he wants himself crowned king of the sea. Just now. Anything down there about your soul? About what? Or perhaps you haven't got one. A soul's a sort of a... Uh, a fifth wheel to a wagon, that's it! What are you jabbering about, shipmate? Souls. I'm jabbering about souls. And how he's got yours in his thorny grip. Who? Hey, Ahab! Oh, woe is me! Look at me! I may have! Look at my little sticky leg! tippity tappity clippity clue! Sailor, <laughs> hey, what all this gibberish is about? I gibberish! Don't yes, gibberish! Ye shipped! Your name's down on the papers! What sign is sign? And what will be, will be. You know nothing of Ahab. Nothing of how he lay like dead for three whole days. Nothing of how he lost his leg. You're a fool, Ishmael. And God pity you. God pity us all. <laughs> Little did I know he was right. And so that next day, I shipped. All right! Let's load this vessel and get ready to <laughs> the dock, please! Each and every one of you, hands on deck! Ladies and gentlemen, would anyone like a blanket? There are, there are some already out on the seats, but we've got 
got some more here. Blankets, anybody? Would you like a blanket, sir? We've got one wonderful. Blankets! Would you like a blanket, anyone? Blankets to keep you warm, ladies and gentlemen. Would you like a blanket, miss? There you are. Anyone from? Would you like a blanket? No, all right. Blankets! No, it's going to get chilly. Anyone like a blanket? Anyone for a blanket? Blankets to keep you warm, ladies and gentlemen. Right, yep. Okay, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Let us ship the Wrigley Sands. Quickly now. Off diverge. We're going to scout the stream overhead. We're leaving them behind as well as our loved ones. We're all going to be safe. We're going to be safe. We're going to be safe from the land for a while. All hands on sails, please. Aye, where is Mr. Stubbs? Mr. Stubbs, I'm right here. Unless anyone has any objections, I say we should crack a barrel of this stuff, eh? And each of us have a tankard full of whatever lights the fire in your belly or your heart, eh? Mr. Stubbs, I'll have no man aboard this vessel who isn't at least a little bit afraid of a whale. Oh, and I'll have no first mate who's a little bit afraid of a tipple, huh? Eh? Hark ye, Mr. I Stubbs. You, sir. I, you I said it once and I'll say it once again. I am on board this vessel. <laughs> to hunt whales for a living and not be hunted by them for theirs. Hmm? I remember Stubbs. Pugnacious concerning whales, but when he was on the deck, he forever wanted to dance and sing. And remember, Mr. Starbuck, sir, high spirits keeps a whale boat a whaling. Mr. Stubbs, please be sure to check the docking ropes haven't snagged on the ship's edge. And as for the rest of you, set yourselves to your task. Yes. We start as we mean to go on, and tonight the captain is set to walk this deck. And I want to see it spick and span. Man, am I hurt? Why? And he parks at both here and not here. They're to be imagined by you so as that you might make them appear. They're the phantoms of this story. But I would like them to be as real as you or I.
Listen to him. He's up there now, pacing the deck in the middle of a storm. Tenacious old Captain A.R. Why, I've heard him up there pacing for the last three weeks. There's not a man aboard this vessel without the courage enough to even look at Captain Ahab, let alone talk to him. All except for you, Mr. Starbuck, sir, of course. Well, perhaps you should find the courage, eh, Mr. Stubbs? Is there a reason he's keeping to himself? Look, Captain Ahab has his means and his ways. As they start to severely impair us, we'd all be best to leave him walk the deck, eh? I've never been in a storm like it. Yes, something irks old Captain Ahab. Oh, I something would irk me too if I was up there during a storm like that. Ah, but it's like two gods in a war with one another. No, Queequeg, it's one god, one Ahab. For anyone to be up there in this weather. Ah, well, get used to it, sailor. The storms get worse to this the further into the Pacific we get, but this one will be over soon enough, eh? Mr. Starbucks, sir, I am hankering after a whale, eh? Oh, I can't wait to get it to my elbow in one! Oh, it's not usually this long away, sir. You afraid to forgotten what whaling is, eh? I saw three whales just yesterday and we didn't go in for three whales. Mr. Stubbs, please calm yourself. They was bowhead whales. Oh, <laughs> we don't hunt bowhead whales, no. Why? They don't pay as much. I know they shouldn't do neither. A sperm whale's mighty bigger, and much more of a buster to kill. Why, harpooner like him, he could lance three bowheads for the sake of one sperm whale, and the price is exactly the same. Hey. Aye, so we wait. Aye, but we wouldn't usually be killing no whales without a captain neither. No, on board the Pequod we might have to. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must relieve Jameson from his post. <coughs> Yes, Stubbs. Aye. What's wrong with the captain? Captain Ahab? Aye. Oh, I don't know. Captain Ahab is sick or something, or... Well, might not be sick, but he's definitely something. <laughs> he's confined himself to his cabin and the deck, and that's about that, really. you shipped with him before, haven't you? Oh, Christ, aye, yeah. Yeah, I've shipped with Captain Ahab more times than I can remember. It's, uh... Oh, no, it's three times, actually, now that I remember. Three times. But... I was aboard. When he lost his leg. How did it happen? Oh, what? You want me to tell you the story about Captain Ahab lost his leg, do you? You want me to give you some sort of big dramatic monologue about how Captain Ahab lost his leg? Aye. Aye. Big words and my best voices. <laughs> Very Aye. well. We was just off the coast of Cape Horn. Ground in between the Atlantic and the Pacific. If I remember rightly, we killed two whales that day. And we was part way through, slopping the second one's guts overboard. When all of a sudden, the air grew cold and thin. And that's when Captain Ahab put both of his feet out on the deck. He was just about to bark an order. When all of a sudden, our ship was clipped by the most monstrous sparmer setting whatever clipped a ship. Oh, we imagined it must be some great goliath of a thing. Because we'd feel the rub of these fish on our boats from time to time, oh yeah. But we ain't never felt a rub like this. It was as if he was trying to hit us. And hit us hard. And no sooner had we thunk that thought, when BOOM! He hits us again. This time harder. This time faster. And we feel the whole ship begin to splinter. And Captain Ahab was tossed overboard and into the foamy brine. And as he gargled and gabbled there in that deathly cold stew. Oh, we lowered a whaleboat down Sir to him quick enough, but just as we did, sitting at the bottom of the disappeared the beneath the surface of the water. water. And everything went kind of calm. All you could hear was the neat, clean creak of the deck. Why, we barely had time to ponder what kind of monster might have gotten it. When all of a sudden, it comes up from the deep, steaming into the air. A mighty megalith. Oh, it was a whale. A great big white whale. As big as three ships. And he was fifth. He was, he was 60 fathoms in the air. And there, in his gob, the unkillable Captain Ahab, with a fire and fury in his eyes. Ah! Well, after many hours waiting, we just assumed Captain Ahab was dead. 
So we drank ourselves silly for the next three days, eh? Yeah. And on that fourth day of drunkenness, we awoke from a stupor. And Carter, the ship's cooper, found him there, laying there on the deck. It was as if he'd been tossed up and spat out like a limpet. Oh, but he hadn't lost a morsel of his prowess, no. But he had lost his leg. And gained a thirst for vengeance. All feet out onto the planks! All men above deck! Hands do it, men! Everyone out! Come on, it's Bill. It's got my head. Come on, it's Bill. Come on! Lower the sails! Take the wind right out of us! Oh, we gotta get through this door, this Bill! Come on! Oh, what the hell? Oh. Two! Six! Heave! Two! Six! Heave! Set the ship to the palm of your hands! Hold on to our tight! We are right where the waters of the earth and the waters of the sky collide! And I'll have neither time to tear my boat to sunder. So take hold, take control. We will weather this storm and be around when morning comes. I'm not oh. Oh, yeah. And that's when we came to know who Ahab truly was. See a whale, man? Oh, you sing I for it. <laughs> what do you do next? You lower away and after him. What tune do you pull, to, man? A dead, dead whale or a stove? Aye. <laughs> so, you all know what we're out to kill. You're all about this ship for it. Nothing else. So I expect you know it, sir. Wells that bring us here. We hunt these beasts for the bounty of their oil and bone, and then we up and ship away to our homes, never thinking anything more of it. Aye! <laughs> well, not today. Today, we hunt a one and only foe. Still a well is here. Unlike any well any of you have ever seen. Whosoever <laughs> eh? of you raises me a white headed well with a wrinkled brow, a crooked jaw, whosoever of you raises me that well with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, who has of something maniacal about his nature. Whosoever of you raises me that white whale shall have this gold Spanish ounce, my boys. <laughs> now you all heard me. I said it's a white whale. So look sharp. And look out for white water. And if you see so much as a white bubble pop, you're singing out. Captain Ahab, sir, you're speaking of the whale that took your leg, no? The very same, Mr. Starbuck. Why, Captain, I've seen him. He's got a curious spout like a shock of wheat. And he's got corkscrews for eyes. Corkscrews for eyes, Aye. stuff. Indeed he does. Aye, he's a white whale. Stuck with sticks, lances and harpoons. Aye, he's stuck full of them. Twisted and deep within his snow white flesh. Oh, then I have seen him too, Captain. He fantails a little curious just before he goes down. Aye, quick, quick, he does. He does. <laughs> Death and devil's men, you've seen him. He even looked him in the eye. Well, now you know him. Know that he goes by the name of Moby Dick. And he is as 
self same Sparma City, what took my leg was Moby Dick that just mastered me. Moby Dick that gave me this dead stump I stand on now. And as the Lord is my witness, I will chase him through perdition's mighty flames and never give him up. So, are you all with me? Aye! Go! We agree. Fetch me your harpoon. You need a sharp eye for a white whale. A sharp blast for a dick. I take this lance. I anoint it with my blood. Both these things, the lance is still mixed with my body's oil, and I bind you both together. Instinct to action, attention to purpose, life to death. Your body and its instrument bound in blood. No! Blindest of instinct, an animal behaving as an animal should. You have no say in this, Mr. Starbuck. Captain Ahab, sir, I think it's madness. To be enraged by such a dumb thing, why, it's a blasphemy. What should we do, Captain, but sail every single ocean and sea for the next three years till we find this great white whale? These men, they have a living to earn. We have their lives in our hands. These men's lives? These men know why they ship. Not for whales. That is all I'm asking them to do. What about my life, Mr. Stark? You don't see it. No. You don't see how this whale taunts me. How he heaps me. I see him in my dreams when he allows me to suffer sleep. So don't talk to me of blasphemy. Why, I'd strike the sun of it insulting me. You heard the men. Are they not all at one with Ahab in his pursuit of the white whale? They are. They are. So don't. Put a foot against it, Mr. Starbuck. Because no amount of words from a first mate's mouth can oppose me. Rebellion! God, keep me. God, keep us all. I. Ishmael was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest of them. My oath was welded with theirs, and the more I shouted, the more Ahab's feud seemed mine. We were inspired by him. In all, and so that night, we drank. <laughs>
And nothing. Not a single whale. So what? We just keep sailing. And inevitable horizons become inevitable horizons. Time stands still as day rolls into night. And night into day. And then we do the same thing all over again. Whale! What? Whale! Whale! Off the starboard bow, man! There's a whale! It's no white whale, whale, but a whale is a whale! A whale! Whale! Oh, my Christ! Wait, Mr. Starbuck, what about Moby Dick? Oh, to hell with Moby Dick, Stubbs. We came aboard this vessel to hunt spermacetes, and that's exactly what we'll do. All right, oh. quick, wait. Fetch your harpoon. Mr. Stubbs, collect your drum, please. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, man, to the whaling boat, please. All men to the whaling boat, please. Mr. Stubbs. Aye. came to and stood before me, but in that too I also stood there as Ahab. All visible objects are but as pasteboard masks. And then I saw it. Where is my ghost? Where is my ghost? Hey! 
ourselves in the palm of my hand, then slowly we'll begin to spread away from our course. Captain Ahab, please allow me to explain. There's nothing to explain, Mr. Starbuck. I may require nothing but nothing harsher than strict obedience. 
But I, uh, I can see the error of my words and the manner of my speaking. I can see now that we must hunt for other worlds. Oh, Captain Ahab. Yes, we must. Yes. So we can keep the men sharpened and refined in the art of killing. So that each whale slew along the path to Moby Dick can fuel my hate, temper my rage, and steal more miles in my ruling. So let us hunt and kill as many whales as we can. And I shall watch in awe as each whale is hold upon that deck and split apart. And I will see its blood as the blood of him that haunts me. I will see it as his blood. His devilish mouth laid wide open. His eyes rolled into the back of his head until it is his blood. And it is his head. Do you agree, Mr. Starbuck? I sir. Good. Then tell the men the next bomb is set in BC and we kill it dead and boil its skin for oil. Alright then, men! You heard it! The next farmer said he we see, we kill it dead and boil its skin for oil. So quick way, sharpen your harpoon. Ishmael, keep your head out of harm's way, and Mr. Stubbs, give us a Very well. Ishmael, take your stance. 
entire watch you've walked up here on the deck and oh well you'll forgive me captain but decks is only made of planks of wood and us poor sleepy chaps below sir our hammocks is but a few inches beneath that that promenade in ivory heel of yours there sir if i may make so bold to suggest some sort of class of muffler maybe chips the carpenter can knock you something up in the line of padding Maybe a ball of tow. A ball of tow? Am I a cannonball? Would you want me as if I should blow? <laughs> no, sir. Is that what you think I am, Stubbs? No, Do you think I am a cannonball? No, Get back to your kennel before I toss you into the sea. Down, dog! And out of my sight. Captain, I'm not your species. I'm asked! No, sir, I will not be tamely called a dog, sir! Then we call ten times a donkey, a mule, and an ass. I'm not being used to spoken to that that way without giving a man a good old whack for it. I don't know whether to strike you or pray for you, Captain. <laughs> pray for Ahab or strike him. Who cares? The same consequences will be levied in the end. Now get out of my sight before I clear the world of you. Let that be a lesson to you all. If you can't sleep, get back to your post. There's much work to be done, even by candlelight. Ah, oh, 
after all these years of saying it with both religious and godless men, I've simply given up trying to be a Christian. I sat in Christian churches and prayed with Christian crews on each vessel I climbed onto. Eventually realised that even Christians can be both miserable and wicked. I think that God can see us now. Your God or my God. Aye, they're either up there or right here with us. Sometimes I wonder what life would be like without it. Whether I'd be happier as a god. No, we need a god, this will. Do we? Well, we need something. <coughs> Why? Because the men I've encountered in this world, they shouldn't be responsible for their own selves. But I fear they'd just burn everything to the ground just to sell it for his ashes. Aye, but what makes an honest man honest and a wicked man cruel? Is God in control of that, or do we turn this hand spy through? By leaving your home, did you disobey your God, and by coming on this ship, did I step away from mine? Sometimes I feel enslaved in slavish heels, as if each and every step is laid out before me, and other times I feel completely stranded. But neither of these is enough to assuage me, so in drawing all conclusions, how else should I feel, Queequeg, except fateless, with a feckless God? Oh, Ishmael, listen to me! But I can't answer you any questions! I'm sorry if that's what you want, but I have this great sense that some fateful drill is boring a hole through all that stands before us. I see it, like the faded chapters of a book not all there and mixed in order. I see a dread hang like a cloud above Ahab and a missed chance to change it. So I see the white whale. It's sharp and tip making its way towards our ship. It's written in my thoughts and in my skin. But make no mistake, Ishmael. It is coming to teach us all what we should know before we're sensed enough to know it. And all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, why would you call it a sea cucumber if you weren't supposed to do that with it? Oh, yes. all right, boys. Hey, uh, how come a harpooner is cleaning the deck? The harpooner should be resting for what happens next. But what does happen next? I don't know. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I haven't got a wink of sleep recently, no. I've just been up there on the poop deck having a snooze. And I have had such a strange dream about Captain Ahab and his leg. Yeah. I dreamed. He kicked me with it. Yeah. And when I tried to kick him back upon my soul, I kicked my own leg right off. No, it's true. Uh, and then Captain Ahab, he turned into a kind of pyramid. And me being the blazing fool that I am, well, I just starts attacking it, kicking it, you know? I. So I'm there battering this pyramid, okay? It's Captain Ahab. And all of a sudden, Ishmael, Ishmael, all of a sudden, a badger-haired old merman with a hump on his back. He takes me by the shoulders and slews me round and he says, What are you about, Stones? Boy, man alive. I was frightened, but I wasn't frightened for very long. So I looked up at him and I says, What business is it of yours what I'm about? You humpbacked old bastard, you! Do you want a kick? That's when. He opened up wide his stern to me, and everything went kind of purple as he forced his fingers into his own skin, and he started peeling himself up from his torso. Man alive. What do you think I saw in there, eh? What do you think I saw? I don't know, stuff. His sternum was almost <laughs> empty, but it was stuck through with marlin spice, and his blackish, greenish heart, there dangling in the middle of it all, Still beating. Oh, says I, maybe I won't kick you then, old man. Why, Stubbs, he says. Why, Stubbs, you have been kicked by Captain Ahab, haven't you? Oh, why, yes, sir, yes, I have. And he kicked you with his beautiful ivory leg, didn't he, Stubbs? Oh, why, yes, sir, yes, he did. He kicked me right here. Why then, Stubbs? You have been kicked by a great man with a beautiful ivory leg. Stop! 
It's an honor. And I considered it an honor, didn't I? For I was kicked by Captain Ahab and made a wise man of it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, well then, the merman, right, he just kind of turned around and started swimming off into the air, all kind of queer, you know, and then he disappeared. Oh, and, and then I snored, then I rolled over, and I was awakened on the poop deck, eh? Now what do you make of that, eh? Then prepare up the burdens and break out. Clean that up. You heard what he said, Stubbs. Yeah, I'm cleaning it up quick, but it's good bread. <laughs> Captain Ahab, sir. Captain Ahab, we must up the Burtons and break out. Burton up and break out? As close to Japan? I sent you here with this jest, Mr. Stark. Captain Ahab, sir, it's the oil in the hold. If we don't do that, we'll lose more oil in a day than we can make good in a year. What we've traveled 20,000 miles for seems worth seeing. Does it? No, it is what it is, Mr. Stark. Captain Ahab, sir. I'm speaking of all of the oil in the hole. And I wasn't speaking or thinking of it at all. Let it leak. Why, I leak. So we have the captain who leaks, who sells the ship with a leaky ship, and, 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 and we have a, a hole that leaks. That's quite fitting. What really? about the owners? Hey! Eh? Oh, let the owners stand upon shores of Brad Tuckett and try to tie him. Jesus Christ, Captain Ahab. Oh, a younger man than you, I might forgive this business, but... In a man as old as yourself, I cannot abide this obsession you have with misery. You will sail this boat into the depths of hell should I stand here. Pretend that I hear sense from you. Devil's man. <coughs> you dare to speak in the least bit critically of me? Get off that deck. No, sir. No, I will not. And allow me to speak a little clearer hitherto, Captain. Because if I can't make my point with words, I will find them. There is one God who is Lord over this earth, and one Captain who is Lord of the Pequod. Now get onto that deck and never speak to me in this manner again. Otherwise, be a knife carved hole where once that critical eye was. Another ship! Captain Ahab! Ship ahoy! A ship to the top deck! Ship Go ahoy! now, Captain Ahab, quickly! Do you know who it is? Oh, the Rachel, sir! Captain Rachel. Gardner! Oh, Captain Gardner of the Rachel, Gardner. sir! Yes, yes. Lord, well. oh, I'm quickly. Captain Ahab! Yes, yes, yes. He's there, sir. He's hating me, sir. Come on! Captain Ahab! Yes, yes, my yes, yes. Captain Ahab! Oh, I Captain Gardner, have you seen the white whale? Aye! Some two well, miles back with Well, uh, not killed. Uh, you, you, you couldn't kill him. You, no. you, you didn't kill him, did you? We left him well alone, as you should too. Yes, but where, Captain Gardner? Where was it you saw him? Ahab, please! I need your help! My boy, at 12 years old, lost upon the waves, floated out alone on a whaling boat. I need to charter your ship for 8 and 40 hours, so I may look for him. Captain Ahab, you're my only hope! Captain Ahab, please! No! Surely, sir, you must... Shut your mouth! Me. I cannot do it, Captain Gardner. He's your boy, Captain and you must Ahab, find him. But I even now I'm losing to. I'm, I'm sorry. God bless you, man. And I find a way to forgive myself, but I, I must go <coughs> to the binnacle watch, Starbuck. And in three minutes from now, all of all strangers, and then brace forward and stop for nothing. We mark Captain Gardner's sighting. And follow back the course. And in that moment, we were all lost. 
Even aboard a ship filled with crew, each and every one of us felt entirely alone. This almost final day, Quique stopped. Upon searching, we found him here, sat solemn upon the deck. At first, we thought him ill or wasting away, but when we tried to feed him, he refused. By this point, he'd been sat here for six days, unmoved. Quique! Where is Queequeg? You on the deck, sir. Uh, still here, please, Queequeg. Get up, Queequeg. Speak, man. He won't speak. Why not? He's gone. And that's the way he'll stay <clears throat> until death is brought upon us. Until death is brought upon us. Well, brought upon us by who? Because I can tell you something. If he doesn't get up, it'll be brought upon him by me. Now, if you're going to die, then die like a man. I said, get up! Get off it! Get up! Get off it! Get up! I want to see him on his feet! Now! I know more like strangeness than you! I know more like strangeness than you, sir! But you're out of line, okay? Listen to me. I am second in command aboard this vessel. If you all see Ahab as some kind of god, then see me as his disciple! And without his word, mine is the order you obey! He doesn't give a damn about your order! Oh, your God! Don't you understand? Quickway is the only one of us who sees it. What is this madness? Huh? Oh, it is madness, sir. Aye, it is madness. But Quickway won't be the first person to succumb to it on this trip. And I see this sickness has consumed you also, Mr. Stubbs, eh? What is it then, men? Hmm? There's only one thing I can do to fix it. This is not right. Sir! What are you all looking at? He's sitting here on this bridge as we pretend it's a boat so you can watch my friend slowly die. Whatever fate brings us, should we simply sit here and accept it? Or is there a way to change what is installed for this man? For all of us! didn't simply sit and watch, but actually took some hand in it. It might be a change. No? Not there? No, of course. Of course there isn't, because this story has its end. And I'm half happy to say this is not how Queequay finished. Or it would only be one more day until we met with it. And my dear friend would die with more honor. and true towards his great white nemesis. Moby Dick. My vision is as sharp as its tip, and so together we were made to kill him dead. That great white beast. He must be slain. And then we must cut him apart piece by piece and spread his life out upon the deck. Tomorrow. It is written in my flesh. Tomorrow is the day we meet our end. And so tonight I sit, <coughs> lit by the burning oils of other creatures, not quite like him. And I will give a prayer to any of my gods that are listening that they might remove whatever soul he has from his body quick. 
So tomorrow, we'll go to take our great white nemesis from this earth and together sink to the depths of hell. Such a day as this that I struck my first blow. <coughs> Boy Hapuna at the age of seventeen. Fifty years ago. Fifty years way across the ocean with the girl I had dreaded. Who waited for me year after year and came home. Each time coming to meet me at the dock of her rosemary dress. A boy there, her arms. Fifty years ago. Fifty years of fool. <laughs> fool old Ahab has been. I look so old now, do I look so very old? No, sir. I feel too deadly phantom, bowed and hunted. As though it was centuries ago, I was on that lost paradise. Let me look at your eye. Stop it. Let me look close. It's the magic glass. It's better than an empty sea or a blanket sky. And through it, perhaps you can see my wife and child as I see them now in the yours. Yes, I can see them. You, you can? Yes, then I can see them. Still, look. Oh, you lower not to me. You lower not when I have dance. You lower not when branded I have must give chase to Moby Dick. Now, I feel it far off. As I look and see what I see in the eyes. Oh, Captain Ahab, sir. You still have a grand old heart locked inside that ivory chest of yours. I say, why should you or anybody give chase to that damned hated fish? Captain Ahab, sir, if I may be so bold as to suggest that we change our course. Why, we could leave these deadly waters. We could bowl back to old Nantucket with a crew of much happier men, sir. 
Why, I think they have everything you and I require back in old Nantucky. Hey? Yes. Yes, I think perhaps they do. And maybe if we make it by tomorrow morning, we can look out on sunny skies. <laughs> uh, about this time, uh, the sun upon our faces. <laughs> Napping. Well, my young boy plays games and his mother recounts stories of times at sea. <laughs> what about this thing? This unearthly thing that commands me. Am I? Is a her or is it God that lifts his arm? Does the sun not move by itself, but, but is moved by something else? And so, and so, does the brain not have these thoughts? But it's God that does the thinking. <sighs> by heaven, no. We turn around this world like yonder windlass, and fate is at the hands of life. <laughs> so, perhaps now we listen and turn our ship towards more sunny skies. <laughs> there she blows! There she blows! What is it, Quigway? On the lead beam, sir! Two miles away! Where? There! It's Moby Dick! Oh Christ, there's Moby Dick! Moby Dick.
had done so 5,000 years ago. Was this some unchangeable fate or something that just happened? It bears no mark for change. I am found again. Again, the only one left to tell thee. Thank you.